From the generalities, let me move to some specific items where I can explain what we mean by these words like make your own house in order, uh, take responsibility, deliver in concrete terms. The first, which we think is the utmost, of the utmost importance to our citizens, stability, economic growth, and jobs. I said before that from our perspective, the single market is by far, is far from complete. There are a number of sectors, fields in economic activity, which are not open to free competition. Uh, let me mention the digital market, capital flows, energy and goods and services. Services make up 70% of economic activity in the European Union. But they are not, there's no integrated single market there. There are, by the last count, 5,000 professions in the European Union which are protected by national rules. So they're not open to competition. And we think that uh, much more of that should be open to international competition. There, is, there are exceptions. Safety, health, and consumer protection are, as far as we're concerned, uh, good areas where you need uh, job protection. But for the rest, we could open that up much more. In the digital area, shopping online, um, geo-blocking, um, adapting legislation to the new digital edge, there are vast opportunities to make life much more easy, that you can have online shopping throughout the entire European Union instead of national boundaries still blocking the transfer of goods. And I see you nodding. You know about shopping online. It is uh, very handy, but there are all kinds of barriers in between, which are national barriers in our particular case. Um, the European Commission has says that we could add about 400 billion euros, so that's 600 billion New Zealand dollars, to the overall uh, gross national product of the European Union if we opened these things up much more. And at the same time, we have to uh, keep the social dimension uh, under consideration, protection of workers. Right now, of course, you know there are different levels of, uh, of prosperity in the European Union. Um, it also means that salaries are quite different from one part to the other. For example, in my country, in the Netherlands, you can find 150,000 people from Poland mainly working in construction, plumbing, uh, carpentry, and things like that. And they are content with lower wages than their Dutch colleagues. So you can see the tension coming there because Dutch people don't get the jobs. And they say, oh, it's the Poles who take those jobs away because they are satisfied with lower wages, sometimes so low that they are I would say, socially not acceptable. And here we want to change things. If you work in another country, we think you should get the same salary as the workers in that country are getting. And you should have the same protection under labor law that the local workers are getting. This means a, a harmonization across Europe of, uh, of agreements, but this should be the, the starting point. And that will also take away one of the Euro-critical arguments that it only means that the companies are profiting because they can hire the cheapest labor and it will push down the costs of labor and the salaries of indigenous people as well. And you don't get the, um, the criticism that those foreigners, they are EU citizens, but they're talked about as foreigners, are taking away our jobs. A second point, I said a deal is a deal. Living up to agreements and taking responsibility before claiming solidarity and support. And this is something that is directed to states in certain parts of Europe. Comply with the Stability and Growth Pact. And that has not been the case for a while in a number of countries. Um, we are being asked to support other states, and of course we would do that because that's what European solidarity is about. But at the same time, we want to see genuine efforts at reforming economies, opening up, freeing up, uh, deregularizing labor markets, making genuine efforts at pushing down the, the deficits that certain uh, governments are incurring. And if that is done in a serious way, of course, in crisis situations, we are willing to help. And so far, we have been helping 
other parts of Europe. But we need to take measures to avoid a, a situation like th that one in the past few years from recurring. And we think that through the EU budget, by having a mechanism in that EU budget, we can affect change like that. I'll come back to that later on. We have a number of financial instruments, which I think I will just skip for the moment. We can come back to them in the Q&A version. But looking at what there is to supervise the banking market, to help uh, the finances of other countries, we think this link to getting your own house in order could be made much stronger. And that in this particular field, European supervision uh, could be made much stronger as well. And that tying the level of political, of financial support to genuine reform efforts in individual countries could also be made much stronger. Now, I, I said before that this is the Dutch view, but we are not the only ones who think like that. In March, this was on 6th March, eight ministers of finance of European countries came together, and the Dutch minister was one of them, and they published a joint declaration. Uh, on financial matters, but they had also some generalities to, uh, to, to state. The main points were, we discuss financial issues, all the member states put together. So there are no back room deals between some of the big countries. Everyone has to be involved. We want, the said the eight, decisive actions at the national level with regard to economic reform and full compliance with EU common rules. And we want to see concrete results for citizens in terms of stability, jobs and growth. Also, it's important to focus on initiatives that have public support in member states connecting to the citizens. Then there are some remarks with regard to financial uh, issues financial mechanisms, but the last point is uh, of extra relevance in view of the fact that the Commission has published its proposal for the new seven-year budget, which runs from 2020 to 2027. The EU's post-2020 budget can help to foster sustainable growth and can be better aligned to the implementation of structural reforms. What we would like to see is that a number of issues, performance issues, and not just in the economic field, are tied to the possibility of getting financial support. Um, financial support for regions, the so-called cohesion fund. If you do not work at reforming your own economy, why should we help the, the regions in your country which, support, which are being supported by the European funds? So it is a two-way street, it is a cooperation, but first get your own house in order. There is a second conditionality uh, to which I will come later on. So this is, let's say, the, the, the overall approach to financial and economic uh, matters. Another thing that we would like to see, and there again we are not alone, is a shift in priorities. Right now, uh, about three quarters of the European budget goes to the agricultural policy, support issues, and to the cohesion fund. We think that priorities are lopsided. These are 20th century priorities. They were applicable in, at the beginning of the European integration process. Right now we are confronted with different uh, issues which should be tackled at a European uh, level and um, which require funding. I've been told that so three quarters of the money of the budget goes to agriculture and cohesion fund, and only 2% go to security issues like border protection, migration, etc. Now, if you see the, the, the size of that challenge, you can see how lopsided those funds are. 